Oh well, I can manage. Um, it's strange that you can't have it on this screen here, but maybe that seems weird. Nobody's got any magic on that. Okay, well I'm gonna I'm gonna make a start in any case. So so thanks very much for for coming along. Um, this is, I guess, for all the colleagues in the unit who kind of thought, what on earth has Ian been doing on all of this uh, psychometric stuff uh, over the past few months? Um, the main thing is it was work with a, with a number of colleagues. I've got a photo to show you in a minute of um, all the different people that we work with, um, and even uh, quite a few of them outside of the JRC, which I think is one of the, the main reasons that we've been able to make, um, I think we can honestly say, so much progress so quickly. Um, I think it's also an interesting project in terms of the fact that we started off looking at one set of issues, in particular, um, the extent to which psycho-targeting, and I'll talk a lot about what that really is, um, is being used to try to manipulate people. Um, and as I think can happen in a, in a hopefully good piece of research, the initial question that we asked was a good one, but during the course of working on the issue, we found some better questions to ask. Um, so I think, uh, and I hope at least, that's been a thing that's stimulated certainly me and um, some of the other colleagues. So I gave a shorter version of this talk um, to uh, the heads of representations of the various uh, commission offices around the member states on Tuesday. And I had about 15 minutes then, so I focused really on why psychology matters and how the insights can help us. And when I said us, what I meant was um, the reps in particular in their job of communicating with um, uh, citizens of the EU. Um, I guess the audience today is a bit different, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about psycho-targeting as well. Um, I'm not one of the great modelers in the unit, I don't claim to be, but there is some stuff in there which um, may speak a bit more to some of the colleagues who are involved with big data and modelling and that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there is a little hint on how to subvert Western democracy, which is always uh, good fun. Um, and then I guess I'll try and twist the how can these insights help us to hopefully giving a few ideas to colleagues about how we can, um, if not do a better job, then, then do even better in terms of marketing the output of the unit. Because I know that Sven mentioned in the unit meeting the other day that we do an enormous amount of work. Um, and I, it's, I say it and I mean it's a real privilege to work with all the colleagues that we have. Um, but it's not always easy from ISPRA in not the best known bit of Northern Italy, perhaps, uh, to really communicate all the work that we're doing. So I reckon I'm gonna speak for more like 20, 25 minutes and then take some questions. Uh, but if you have a burning issue, then please feel free to come in. Um, I always try and give the main three messages at the beginning, and then um, if I contradict myself during the course of the talk, you can, um, you can, you can pick me up on that. Um, so the first thing, um, and maybe in this audience that is a slightly controversial thing to say, um, but I would argue um, that there's an awful lot of good science to show that not in terms of thinking up policy answers, but in terms of communicating policy messages, the emotions and the psychology of the audience matters more than the message itself, which in, uh, uh, and as I'll talk about a bit, an organization like the Commission, for many, many colleagues, is a very deeply countercultural uh, thing to say. Um, but I think there's a lot of good science done by much cleverer people than me um, to help us think uh, why that might be the case. So I think that's a, 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 an interesting message, even if it's not so novel in the world of behavioral uh, and cognitive psychology. The second point, uh, main message that I hope you'll see through the, the, the talk, um, is that the question that we looked at at the beginning, which was to what extent are people being manipulated by uh, psychologically targeted messages, turned out to be, in terms of what's really going on in terms of elections and referenda, essentially the wrong question. It's an important research topic, and I can point you to one or two names of people who are doing pioneering work in that area. Um, but in terms of what's actually going on in the market, as it were, then it's community building, targeting, and what's called re-messaging on social media. Uh, and I'll talk about all of those things. And then for the last part of the talk, the kind of so what, um, uh, there is an ethical dimension to all of this. Um, I would say that the, um, 
the ethical dimension is actually reduced very usefully by the fact that we're talking much more about targeting and re-messaging than we are about psycho-targeting. Um, but again, I'll try to explain why. Okay, uh, I always try to start with the why uh, and end with the so what. Uh, so the why we're doing this um, is quite uh, easy to explain. Um, and it's basically that 2016 was a very bad year for anybody who believes in facts, science, liberal democracy, respectful behavior to one's uh, fellow citizens, um, and so on, um, for reasons that are well known. And I don't need to explain uh, to this audience, all of whom read uh, several newspapers, certainly per week and in several different languages, many different languages. Um, and this, of course, caught the attention of, of big politicians. Um, and within our wider house, President Juncker expressed his concerns. And First Vice President Timmermans has also given a number of speeches um, about his concerns about fake news, um, fact uh, or post-fact society. There are many different uh, euphemisms, but I think you've got the idea of what I'm talking about. Um, and as rightly should happen um, in uh, a large administration, when the top of the house uh, expresses concerns, then some colleagues are asked to, to work on issues. And uh, Vladimir uh, Sucha, our director general, asked me to uh, lead a team of, of researchers. That makes it look like it's a big team. Um, at least half of the, the people there, I hope you recognize. Um, but there are also a number of, uh, of external uh, people. I'll show you pictures during the course of the um, uh, of the of the talk, um, and that photo was taken on the sixth of uh, June here in Ispra when we got a really interesting, I think, bunch of people together uh, for a workshop, um, and that was the culmination of six we uh, six months of work. I beg your pardon, um, and it also means that it's much easier for us to talk uh, publicly about the work and try and market it a bit, not because it was ever hyper secret. It wasn't. Um, but we just weren't very clear within the JRC um, what kind of political uh, margin for manoeuvre or tunnel we were operating uh, within. Um, and you know, we didn't have a, a formal position of the College of, of Commissioners, this kind of thing. We still don't, but I think we've, we've understand, understood much better what we are and are not talking about. Uh, and as a result of that, we can uh, give a bit more profile to the work. Um, and an uh, interesting thing for colleagues who are uh, publishing policy-related research is that it can often be just as, if not more, effective to have some journalists write about your work um, and give hooks to things that you've put in journals, um, as it can be um, on the purely academic side to write in journals. So, um, as you know, I partly come from the sort of uh, cabinet and policy world in Brussels, and. Uh, a uh, few different journalists I know quite well, and Simon Cooper is a guy that I really uh, respect and, um, and, 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 uh, and have a lot of time for. Um, and as well as writing about football, as uh, Lynn was uh, pointing out earlier, he also writes a lot about populism. And he came along to um, the workshop, and I'll talk about his points on, on substance in a, in a few slides. Um, but he was kind enough to write up the main uh, output of the um, uh, of the workshop in two articles that were published in the Financial Times, uh, not um, uh, this weekend, but the last weekend and the weekend before. Um, and I can circulate those um, uh, if, uh, if they're useful. And this was the second one, how to deal with populism. Um, and I can honestly say that they're quite a long way ahead of various other um, articles in the media. There was a, an article on Newsnight in the UK uh, earlier this week, reputable, serious uh, news program on uh, late each evening, which was you know, quite a long way behind the curve of what Simon had already published. So we're, we're definitely credible. Um, OK, uh, so uh, these people are going to come back uh, now and again. Uh, behavioral economists, psychologists are very keen on the idea of repetition. Um, it's surprisingly effective in terms of locking in concepts. So um, I hope you'll um, well, I, I hope you'll, um, you'll you'll come to agree with me on that. Um, but um, I guess my my reason for showing this again and my test to myself on uh, Tuesday was 
I'd better follow my own advice and see if I've got the psychology of the audience I was speaking to there right. So that doesn't quite work today, but um, imagine for a minute that your job is to do social media communications in the representations uh, around the European Union. Then I think that what these people uh, feel like is more or less this. Uh, so this is from the film Gladiator, uh, and the idea would be they're a pretty well-drilled army, and you know the Romans did actually win this battle uh, in the film, um, but they wouldn't say no to some slightly higher tech weapons in order to uh, to deal with the enemy. Uh, and one of the nice things about doing this talk in mid uh, 2017 rather than the end of 2016 is that there have been um, some victories uh, on the, um, let's say, the, the mainstream rather than the populist side of things. Um, and I'll talk again about, or later on, about what Macron and his team uh, did well in terms of social media that I think um, certainly the, the, the Brexit campaign and the Clinton campaign, because some of this is explicitly political as well as being about communicating with citizens on behalf of the, the Commission and the European Union, uh, what Macron did well. Um, and I think in particular, um, they used social media very effectively to track what people were talking about in close to real time. Uh, I'm gonna argue in a moment that um, you know, uh, social media gossip is a terrible way to make public policy, um, that is populism, but as a way to think about vectors for communicating policy that you've made in a much more rational way, I think it can be very useful. And I think Macron, uh, and his people very wisely listened to people and perhaps as importantly made sure they were seen to be listening to people all around the country. Okay, this is a bit of marketing for our uh, annual conference. Um, maybe just the names are useful. So Sandra Matz presented at the workshop, Simon Cooper's up there. The top left guy is Charles-Elie Jordan, who's a, a consultant but has taught us a lot. Uh, the guy down here is Michael Bassetta. He doesn't really look quite like that. Um, uh, at Copenhagen University, and the guy in the middle, Tom Moylan, is uh, a guy in DigiCom who works on social media. Um, and the guy that we might have um, at that uh, uh, annual uh, conference is George Lakoff, uh, who for anybody who's into this field is, is a really, really big name. So if he can come, that would, be, that would be really great. The only slightly downside for me is that I was slated to get to give at least part of the annual lecture um, but uh, Vlado has offered it to Lakoff, and so um, I think with predictable results where I'm concerned. But, uh, but there we go. Oh, okay. So uh, this was um, just to make clear um, that I'm not, again, for this audience on Tuesday, I'm not trying to tell these people how to do their jobs, uh, simply to give them some ideas from a recent uh, research project. So two things uh, to keep in mind um, before uh, I get into the main substance, and I've given you some hints. Um, so this is uh, the first point. Um, I think just as a matter of practice, that is absolutely how people communicate nowadays. We have a couple of younger members uh, in the audience. I think that's very good. Um, and my guess would be uh, that the way that you and your friends communicate on a regular basis involves, haha, <laughs> mine's charging. Imagine, imagine that this is a smartphone with images and WhatsApp and, um, and so on. I'm not a very high-tech person myself. I only got onto Facebook a year ago, um, but I do recognize that that's how people are communicating. Um, and um, just a couple of examples. So this was seen uh, as a YouTube video was seen uh, about three million times uh, in the run-up to the last UK uh, election a few weeks ago. And again, it's kind of links to this idea of how do you publicize work. I think, I mean, this is a political attack ad but it doesn't show anywhere the insignia of the parties that were gonna benefit from it. In the same way that I think Simon Cooper's articles in the Financial Times were probably taken more seriously and read more widely, however irritating that is, because the Commission and the JRC were not mentioned in them. Now, that's something to think about, but um, if in the end what matters is passing messages to people, um, then it may be useful at least some of the time uh, to communicate in a way whereby the journalists know who's done the work, but it may not be uh, advertised in the article. It's something to think about. Uh, this was also to show that um, how to communicate visually and without words is definitely not lost on uh, some very uh, influential uh, parts of the uh, media and system. 
And this is another point that I think is important for people um, in the Commission, if I may, in the sense that you do occasionally hear this sort of slightly arrogant idea that, you know, oh, people, you know, kids nowadays, you know, it's not like in my day, they're not careful, they don't read things properly, um, they just send each other videos and images. And I think that's a bit intellectually lazy um, in the sense that European citizens, of course, we can always do better, but do have a very, very high level of literacy um, and can read and do read. They're just overloaded with information like we all are. Um, and it turns out, you know, the English expression is a picture paints a thousand words. Um, images are actually a very efficient way of potentially trying to sift through enormous amounts of information with which people are bombarded. So having thought about it a bit, and of course there are issues with clickbait and nonsense images and vulgar images and goodness knows what, there's always a risk of dumbing down. Um, but I'm not willing to dismiss visual communication in a world that's hypersaturated with information quite as quickly as, as some people are. Then the second point I already gave a, a hint to in terms of what people, I hope you can keep in mind while I talk about the real stuff. Um, and this is an ultra JRC point. You know, what do we use uh, when we want to solve a problem? Well, we use the brain. Um, and we use the brain uh, for a very, very good reason, namely that it's uh, the best way, and I'm confident that's the case, to think about everything from uh, how do you build a bridge and calculate the load-bearing weights, uh, how do you write a rigorous legal text, uh, how do you do some serious econometrics. Um, but if you then think about communicating, and I mean communicating in a broad sense, just visually what the results of that work look like, purely visually, and this is helpful in that the words don't mean anything, this is just what people use lorem ipsum to kind of map out uh, uh, the, the length of a text. You know, just visually ask yourself the question, how easily can I engage with that? Or, and this is the worst, or in nearly every other audience that I would ever show the next slide to, this one works perfectly, uh, but this audience is going to correct an error. <laughs> um, but the point is that unless you're absolutely into um, that stuff, um, then it can really blind you to what I think is the most effective way of communicating. And here I come back to the idea, so the heart represents that. Um, that you need to think as carefully, if not more carefully, about the emotional uh, uh, situation and the psychological uh, perceptions and biases of your audience as you do about the message, uh, or rather about the, the issues that you're trying to communicate. And the idea is in a visual world or an audiovisual world, then compelling visual, I would say, bridges to get people to then access the main work are very much part of how to communicate. I'm not for a moment saying that the research and the policy issues shouldn't be rigorously done with the brain. Please don't misunderstand me. But in turn, this is about communicating messages rather than about thinking up policy solutions. So, okay, let me get into the, I called it full lecture, that's slightly pretentious, but um, let, me, let me try and spend maybe five minutes on each of those uh, to do them some justice. There are one or two images which are slightly provocative. Um, I think everyone's old enough to see them, and they're not that bad for the, the younger members uh, of the audience. Okay, so just a couple of stories. That's another bit of uh, uh, cognitive psychology is that people tend to remember stories better than they remember, uh, I don't know, facts. So um, when I first joined the commission, I did some work on um, Western Balkan trade policy. This was uh, 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 sort of 99, 2000. And I went over to DG Trade. I was working in DG ECFIN at the time. Uh, and gave a talk, and at the end of the talk, a uh, very experienced colleague came over and said, you know, yeah, that wasn't too bad. And I said, you know, thanks very much. Um, and he said, but you might want to get some glasses. I said, oh, okay, so I kind of thought about this, and I went back, and I kind of went back to my computer, looked at my slides, and checked the numbers, and it didn't seem to be any obvious mistake. And then I thought a bit more, um, and then I realized that the point that he was really trying to make was, if I'd looked a bit more like this, rather than uh, even more youthful than I, than I allegedly still look, um, then people might have taken me a bit more seriously. Um, and I think it's interesting in that context that um, George Lakoff, uh, one of the experts in visual aspects of communication, um, has uh, gray, gray hair, a gray beard, 
and glasses. I don't know if he smokes a pipe, but, um, but, uh, but there we go. And then, uh, so this was actually the, the, the front piece of um, uh, the, the paper that we all uh, produced. So um, Pablo and many other colleagues were involved in it. And um, the idea was um, that we might want to uh, think of an image that could potentially go viral. And being like me, um, you kind of think, well, how on earth do you make a, an image go viral? Uh, it's very difficult, you know. Um, uh, so I sort of prefer to try and be creative rather than, you know, uh, and so I thought, well, hang on a minute, maybe we can get an image that's already gone viral um, and put that on the front of the paper, and then we're guaranteed to have a viral image um, on the front of the paper. Uh, and then I, so I, I managed to find this image, which I like. Um, but then when I was preparing an earlier version of this talk, <clears throat> I was kind of mucking around on Google Images, and I found uh, this image. Um, and the messages are identical. There might be one word different, but you know. So you know, for commissioned people, rigorous people of the head, you know, um, we probably even emotionally agree with those messages. But for most people, I'm not sure that's the case. So then you can ask yourself the question, why did this image, this was shared like 60, 70,000 times on, on Twitter, um, whereas this one wasn't. Why did this one go viral uh, and the other one didn't? And you can, you, I'm only guessing, uh, but my guesses are that one of the things that the first image invokes, at least for people who grew up in predominantly uh, uh, Christian uh, 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 inspired cultures, uh, legal systems and so on, is this idea that's deep in our culture of um, angelic figures and cherubs as messengers, uh, messengers of the word of God, I would argue. I'm not a particularly religious person myself, but everything from birthday cards to fridge magnets to paintings that you see um, if you go to a museum uh, have that idea within them. So if you, if you look at the boy, you know, he's quite an angelic boy, um, at least subconsciously. Um, and the other thing, so if you look at this image, then is that uh, the mother looking over the boy's shoulder? Quite possibly, it's during the women's march. So there's this idea of female care for uh, a boy. Um, and that's also for reasons I'll go and show you. It's almost impossible to look at that image and have a primarily intellectual reaction. Um, any sentient, reasonable human being, when they look at that, has an emotional reaction. Um, and it turns out, as I'm going to show you, um, that these um, emotional reactions are very well understood scientifically and they're very widely used practically. Um, so although some of this is funny at some level, I often think that humor is a great vector for truth uh, in society. Um, it's just that we don't normally look at things in this angle, which is probably why it's good I'm doing this on a Friday afternoon. Um, but I really think we should be careful not to think of this as unscientific, you know, it's not based on, uh, you know, uh, quadratic equations and rigorously demonstrated uh, Granger causality. Um, but that doesn't mean that serious scientists haven't worked on this, and, and I'll show you that they have. So my first point in terms of uh, trying to transmit messages to people is that the imagery uh, is incredibly important and certainly far more important than um, uh, any um, mainstream uh, economist before the time of Daniel Kahneman would ever really have, have taken seriously, and I think that was a mistake. Um, so this I'm not going to talk about in detail, um, but if, there's, if there are three slides that I honestly uh, and seriously uh, and humbly recommend that you might want to print out and keep anywhere near where you make decisions, you know, the kitchen table, your office, a telephone, whatever, um, then I really recommend these because they are uh, biases that um, we're all subject to. I'm subject to them. Um, I suggest that you might be subject to them as well. Um, mainly, coming back to the, one of the slides I showed at the beginning, not because people are stupid, but because we're very, very busy. You know, if I need to walk out and open that door or open this door, I, I don't or press the button on the keyboard. I don't measure with a rule of the distance to you know, the handle and then do a computational calculation about the angle that I need to lift my arm at and the distance. You know, I can do it intuitively and instinctively because I've opened at least tens of thousands of doors during my life. 
So I have a heuristic in my brain which lets me open the door. And we, pr we, we approach an enormous amount of our decision making, in a sense, very, very rationally, so that we have time to think about the things that do require computation, like complicated regression analysis that I'm not very good at, um, by not being exhausted by all the small things we have to do, like brushing our teeth or driving to work even. Um, and one of these uh, uh, examples of bias is stereotyping. Um, and I'm fairly sure that if there are any younger colleagues and especially younger female colleagues who've tried to present a really good piece of work at a conference, they've at the very least subconsciously been aware um, that they've been uh, subject to biases um, because they're not uh, older male with beards, glasses, and smoking a pipe. Um, and that's something that we should take seriously because that can uh, impact uh, the reach of very, very uh, solid work uh, and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Um, and in terms of this being scientific, um, well, there are some people who, for various reasons, don't take the Nobel Prize totally seriously, but um, I think it's still you know, not a bad starting point in terms of people who've, um, who've done serious work and serious thinking. And it's not just because they won it, but you know, these guys, especially in the 70s, so that's Amos Tversky, who would have won the Nobel Prize with Kahneman, but he, he, he died uh, before Kahneman was awarded it. Interestingly, Kahneman was actually in Tversky's shadow uh, through most of his academic career, even though nowadays he's the one that people have heard of after winning the prize. But these were brave scientists. You know, in the 70s, they not only had the thought that some aspects of perfect rationality didn't necessarily describe uh, the world as they saw it, but they thought up rigorous experiments, and they tested them, and they retested them, and they presented their ideas at conferences, and they got some of them to be taken seriously, and, and rightly so. That doesn't mean I think we should rip up all models based on uh, rational theory, not at all. I'm not some kind of uh, economics heretic. I, think, I simply think that we should take this work seriously, um, as well as taking uh, the more um, standard uh, micro and macro models seriously. Um, but I do think it's very important when presenting this kind of work from the JRC point of view, and it's one of our, our kind of calling cards, is to say that we're not just uh, presenting some thoughts that you know have come, people have come up with on a Sunday afternoon. This is hard science. Um, so I'm now going to show you some more science. I would argue that that's science, that's science, that's science, and I've got a balancing one in a few slides. That's science. Uh, and the reason why. Um, is that, in this case, neurologists rather than cognitive psychologists have strapped things to people's brains and demonstrated that these most basic images related to fire, sex, food, family immediately trigger the amygdala. So this is the, the reptile part of the brain, um, the bit that was relatively the largest when we were far less evolved. Excuse me. And if anybody doesn't believe um, that uh, there are images to which we uh, respond uh, primarily emotionally, is any, I'm not going to do it, I'm not cruel. Is anybody in the room have a fear of spiders or arachnophobic in any way? So I guarantee you that if I, I'm not going to do it, if I, that I put a big image of a spider on that screen, the primary reaction of this, even this ultra highly educated audience would not be intellectual. Um, so, I hope I've sort of convinced you of that, but the interesting thing is that in many ways, uh, the first experimental cognitive psychologists were not uh, academics, I would argue. So I don't know if this is Don Draper, so it's a TV series called Mad Men, but in many ways, these guys were the first um, serious uh, behavioral scientists. So you, it's really worth watching a few episodes um, if you wanna get into this stuff. So there's one episode where they have a very involved discussion about how to pile up cans of tin peas in a supermarket, what shape it should be, where it should be located, how many they should remove such that, and I'm afraid it was in the 1950s, housewives in the, in the US would think that their friends were already buying them, but they didn't want to leave none left because then there wouldn't be any more to take. And, you know, that they were doing, in effect, uh, serious... Um, uh, behavioral science. Um, and um, what you then see is that um, there's quite a mirroring 
between the images that I was just showing you linked to the amygdala um, and advertising. So that's a well-known Rolling, uh, Rolling Stone advert. This was quite a successful uh, family-based campaign. Uh, that one was quite successful, so I've now balanced the other one. Um, and it, this is funnier in Belgium, but you know you can even use wild animals to sell stuff that is barely even chocolate. Um, and then I was presenting with a NATO colonel, um, so I had to kind of give a little bridge to his stuff. Um, and it turns out that you know uh, the Russian uh, propaganda machine, um, which is certainly active nowadays, is not blind to all of this stuff either. And I just talk about a couple. Uh, because if you or I look at this, then we probably think, you know, shell suits are a bit 1980s or, you know, uh, the girls, you know, maybe have got slightly odd things in their hair or something. Um, but if you try and think about that image, not from a sort of educated Western liberal perspective, but from, you know, somebody in Kazan or Vladivostok or who perhaps comes from a more um, conservative with a small c, orthodox, religious, uh, from a religious point of view background, then in many ways it echoes, so this is a 19th century royal uh, portrait. I'm, I'm interested in the history of art in general, and this idea of the kind of supine dog, uh, you know, looking up to the authority figure. Um, well, okay, in this image, the dog isn't actually looking up, but this use of a dog to, to, to elevate the status of the, um, of, the, the high, of the high status figures and the use of family uh, to, to engage with the emotional part of the brain um, is one that's been used uh, throughout uh, art history. And again, if, if we look at this one, you know, it is funny to our eyes, um, I think mainly because we kind of think of Brokeback Mountain, you know? Um, but if you imagine people um, perhaps who aren't so uh, deeply uh, 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 sort of Western and liberal and so on, then it may in some ways echo, so this is Tsar Nicholas II, and this again uses this idea of the you know, high status figure dominating an animal, um, which is present in uh, you know, uh, centuries and centuries of, of religious and, um, uh, and uh, aristocratic uh, uh, painting and representation. And this is another, you know, if you think of hunting images of aristocrats, in many ways, this is just an updated version. Um, so what I'm trying to get across here is um, that one, um, people who are using uh, images to convey messages are ultra aware and are using scientific psychology. And I don't think we should be afraid of using the word scientific just because it's based on images and use of animals and, you know, chocolate and so on. Um, or fire. Um, and secondly, and I think that's in a way more interesting, especially when you think of an image like this one, the same image, I'm sorry if it upsets people, it's not the, but the same image um, can be understood very, very differently um, by two different groups uh, culturally, which I think is just an interesting thing to, to, to think about. Um, all right, so then I'll talk a little bit about psychotargeting and then um, a bit about uh, about what, you know, what the implications might be. So psycho-targeting essentially um, takes two things. It takes uh, an assessment of people's psychological traits. Uh, so this is the ocean model. Uh, there's also a thing called Myers-Briggs that a lot of people have done at some point or another in a training course. You know, are you uh, agreeable? Well, hopefully, conscientious? Well, hopefully, extrovert, introvert? We can probably take it either way, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and people, uh, so there are well-developed uh, scientific uh, questionnaires to assess this, um, and uh, people do them online. And then uh, there were a series of experiments uh, done uh, a few years ago where people uh, voluntarily uh, filled in both a psychological questionnaire and gave access to their Facebook likes. And what, and this is a great audience to present this to, because when you kind of start to get into this with uh, communications people, then they really do start to look at their iPhones. Um, but what you do then, uh, you combine the two, and then you can build a model which, when you plug in other people's psychological traits, allows you, at the very least, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, when you plug in other people's Facebook likes, allows you to infer their psychological type. So uh, Pablo did a nice, I don't know how to do this uh, uh, computationally, um, 
Uh, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, but the basic idea is that once you take, you build a data set which combines uh, Facebook likes and uh, psychological type from a questionnaire, then you build up a, a model which can uh, allow probabilistically, not with perfect accuracy, uh, deriving from a third person's likes what their psychological profile is and may allow you to channel information. So I should say that the guy <coughs> where this gets kind of media interesting, so Michael Kosinski was um, at Cambridge at the time, and he did this based on uh, voluntarily filled in questionnaires. Uh, there's another researcher, Kogan, um, used this Amazon MTurk platform. So this is a way of, it's essentially like having very, they're not quite slaves, but very poorly paid workers all around the world doing menial IT tasks. Um, so his is ethically much more questionable in that um, they were paying people to fill in this stuff. So does that make it more or less accurate? My guess, I'm not the, you know, the, the sort of, um, uh, I'm not confident to quote the social science literature, but I'm fairly sure that if you're, if you're paying people to fill in stuff, there's a risk of some greater biases, but that maybe is for a more uh, academic discussion. The reason it's very difficult to discuss at all is that the Kogan work has never been published, so it's not uh, a subject to any peer review. The other thing is that Facebook closed down the possibility to fully suck up likes a few years ago, so it's not possible to fully replicate the, the, the work either, so it's not straightforward uh, to test it. Um, yeah, so this is, in terms of anecdotes, I, I, I call this one the the biscuit uh, slide. So I was kind of presenting this a few weeks ago, and I said, um, oh, Sandra Matz, who is up there, um, uh, who gave me this slide uh, and allowed me to pinch it, um, uh, said, um, uh, I said, oh, you know, but Sandra's a, a behavioral uh, psychologist, and so she knows that if you have, the, the human memory is kind of biased towards the unusual, and so if you have an extraneous image on an otherwise explanatory slide, then people will remember it, and that's why she's put a biscuit in the middle of a slide, which is all about connections between... And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, Ian, it's not a biscuit, it's a cookie. <laughs> um, uh, so, so what that shows is that um, what I've been talking about doesn't only apply to Facebook, but this would be why, and this is Nuno's line always on this, you know, if he, on booking.com, uh, books a flight to uh, South Africa today, then tomorrow, on, when he looks on Amazon.com, you'll have an advert for the Lonely Planet Cape Town or this kind of thing. So all of this stuff is being communicated across, and when I come to uh, community building, I'll talk about that. Um, benign research, so this will be kind of... That's Kaczynski on the right. I don't know who the guy is on the left. I haven't read any of his uh, published works, but he's got a lot of citations. Um, so Sandra, for example, uh, would use this... Uh, to, uh, for example, uh, design, uh, I mean, they do this with real companies and real adverts. They uh, will design, imagine two people like going on holiday to Spain, um, and one person or group of people is an extrovert, then they'll get an advert showing, you know, people partying in Spain, and the more introvert group will get an advert based on, you know, images of the Alhambra or something like this. And it does show that, you know, um, you can do some uh, demonstrably effective psycho-targeting in terms of click-through rates, which they can monitor, and this kind of thing. At the same time, uh, coming back to these guys, um, you might want to uh, uh, push uh, gambling adverts to compulsive people. You might want to push xenophobic material to anxious people. Uh, and Pablo's gone, but another uh, issue of interest is whether you can push, if you can do this in real time, uh, differential pricing to people who are drunk. Um, the last one is, is very much at the cutting edge, uh, I think, of academic research, but um, I know a few uh, students, certainly, who would be good uh, models for testing it on. Um, anyway, um, in terms of how effective is it really, um, I think, you know, we're definitely not in some kind of brave new world, and purely by virtue of the fact that this stuff is not being used intensively in um, referenda, political election campaigns, um, then I do think there's one thing that we need to be very careful of. Um, so the main thing, a reason why I think it's not being used is that it's just too complicated. So imagine that you want to target 
I've listened to all sorts of, read a lot about uh, people who were involved in the social media part of the Trump campaign, and they uh, initially were targeting about 15 million people, uh, one five million, uh, and then they were able to subdivide them to some extent, but if you would really want to do serious psycho-targeting, you'd need you know, several million messages of a differential type calibrated to psychological type, and that's just not realistic. Um, it's also the case that, you know, whereas if you have one product, you know, a holiday to Spain, that product is relatively stable. I mean, Spain is likely to stay where it is. You know, the Alhambra is what it is. A disco is a disco. Whereas politics evolves so quickly that the idea that you can, um, you know, you may well become very quickly dated even if you could subdivide your information. So this is Karen Cadwallader, uh, who's Carol Cadwallader, who's written a lot of stuff in The Guardian. And I think the one thing um, that we have to be careful about in her work is it would be lovely to think as kind of uh, Western uh, liberals, which I think probably most of this, probably all, I hope, uh, in many ways, audience uh, might consider itself to be, that what happened in 2016 was simply that, um, you know, the people were tricked by mass manipulation through Facebook. Um, and I think that's far too simplistic. I think it's in many ways wrong. But it can be a very comforting narrative uh, to people who think that elites have got all the right policy answers for uh, non-elites. Um, so I think her work needs to be taken a bit carefully. Um, this is kind of my last real slide on, um, on psychometrics. Uh, I'm going slightly over time, but um, uh, hopefully that's not a too big a problem on a Friday afternoon. The biggest issue here is budget. So at the moment, it is simply not possible to monitor, certainly not um, in real time, and almost certainly not ex post either, um, money spent on Facebook, for example, ads by, let's give an example, um, uh, the Russian government through uh, a bank in South Africa uh, for ads targeted on um, the northern part of Sheffield, so a kind of post-industrial English town, or it might be in the Netherlands or anywhere else in the world. Um, at the moment, the only people who know how much is being spent by whom and on what is Facebook itself, and they're under no uh, obligation to reveal that information. So you find that electoral spending laws, which are often very, very strict, but are designed to control number of posters, number of leaflets, who can go where on buses, when in fact the Trump campaign spent 80 to 90 million US on uh, Facebook advertising, and it's estimated that the Leave campaign spent over 80% of its uh, uh, overall budgets on social media campaigning. So uh, there are massive uh, uh, transparency issues here. And then it's also the case, so my other line kind of on all this is that the old marketing slogan used to be, the CEO would say, I know I waste half of the money I spend on advertising, I just don't know which half. And the fact is that, re that Facebook gives you real-time information on who's looking, who's clicking, how often, and so on. Um, so at least potentially, um, you don't waste hardly anything at all. And then you can do this targeting, which I'm about to come on to. Um, so my point would be, I don't think that, and this is a very Brexit slide, I don't think um, that this psycho-targeting or targeting through social media can you know, shift an election 20% in one direction or another, but especially in a system like the UK or the US where you have particular states, you know, a race in a given state, when it's a close race, uh, then I think it certainly can potentially tip the balance. And it's estimated that the Trump victory came down to 70,000 votes in four key states. And then when you think that Trump spent 80 or 90 million on his social media campaign, do I think it won in the election? I mean, you know, somebody cleverer than me could try and do some regression analysis on that, but um, it seems to me it's not totally unlikely that it won in the election. So what? So this is really aimed at, um, you know, the communications people in the commission, but I hope there's at least, it triggers some ideas about how to uh, get our work better known in the, in the unit as well. I'm not suggesting that we ask Sven for a big social media budget, but you know, hopefully it gives some ideas. 
So, okay, what do people actually do? So this was this guy, Charles-Ali uh, Jourdan, who was at the, the workshop on the 6th. And he said, the first thing that political parties and others do is they build a community of people who are interested in their product uh, and so on. So this would be, you'd collect across Facebook activity, uh, uh, Twitter, whether people are reading your newsletters, how active they are in your community. And in the US, where the data uh, protection rules are weaker, that can be being combined with credit, date, credit rating data, uh, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and the key point, and this goes to the heart of what I was saying at the beginning, why do they do all of this? Because the more that you know about somebody's worldview, the better you can communicate with them on their terms. So, I mean, an example for this audience, to somebody who's never been to a single economics or econometrics lecture, you can't start off your talk by, by discussing R squareds even. I mean, that will fall on deaf ears, you know. So having a, a sense of understanding the audience, I do think, is crucial to, to all communication. Um, and so this is then, I guess, the, the what did Trump really do slide. So this is kind of me uh, a bit crudely overlaying one of Charlie's slides, but again, I did ask him for permission to do it. So Clinton took much more the traditional approach, so she spent money on TV ads, and then that's one message for the whole population. It's also you can attack it immediately if you're the opposition because everybody can see it. What Trump was doing um, was via Facebook, so it's not invisible, but it's discreet. You can only begin to see it if you're the Clinton side as people begin to forward it around their friends and so on. But the initial message you can't see immediately. And what they would then do, so it, it doesn't really matter what these groups are called, but imagine they wanted to target gun lovers in Pittsburgh. Then the old way would be you would pay someone like Don Draper to think up the brilliant advert and then put it on TVs and billboards all over Pittsburgh or, or wherever. What they do, rather, is subdivide the audience on Facebook and then they don't worry too much about the quality of individual ads because they produce five or ten, they send them out, and they just see what works. So the stuff that engages people, that gets re-forwarded and liked, and you can see it in virtually real time, they re-message, and the other stuff they get rid of, which is not far off a scientific controlled trial, if you think about it. You have a very large sample of uh, very similar people, you know, in terms of location, you can control for age, you can do all sorts of stuff, um, and then you simply discard uh, that which doesn't have a high impact. So even though the, the politician these messages were supporting was ultra anti-science in an incredibly retrograde way, the people who were doing his social media for him in many ways were ultra-scientific. And I think that's another, I find that often quite a nice way to present this point to non-scientific audiences. It kind of it also advocates that the JRC has got a role in terms of looking into all of this stuff. Uh, so let me just catch up with where I am. Yeah, so in terms of, so this, some of my slides are a bit uh, Brit-centric, but um, what can you do? Um, so this was um, Yes Minister, for anybody who knows it. So this was a kind of famous satire about uh, being a British civil servant. And very often, um, I guess the JRC parallel would be that we tend to write information as if we're communicating with a peer group of scientists and economists. And that may well be fine when the peer group is, uh, you know, a, a bunch of, of scientists at a conference, but it isn't always. And it's always a good uh, question to ask who the audience is. Um, and what this stuff is telling us is that um, we now have far better technological means to at least think about passing the same message to different subgroups of the population or the target population through different means. So it might be an image for one group and text for another, um, but this idea of calibrating messages according to an audience that we better understand is something that I think has broader application than just uh, political communication, and that's how I think we should uh, go about doing it. Um, I think Macron uh, understood that well um, because they invested an awful lot of time in trying to understand the sub-segments of the French uh, uh, electorate. Uh, and they did some of that face-to-face. -face. This isn't all, you know, magic of social media. Some of it is just going around the country and talking to people. Um, so th this is my like, kind of risky bit at the end. Um, so 
I think, um, you know, it would, might be lovely to think that in the future everybody would have, you know, identify as, as, as fully European, but I think most people in a country like Italy, I'm fairly confident when in the, you know, the JRC Football Cup, you know, you have Italian regions playing against, you know, other nations. I think most people could identify themselves with that kind of hierarchy of, of identities. And then Simon Cooper has this, I think, really brilliant point that um, although many people in this audience will be big fans of globalization, and I am in many ways, um, for many, many people, it reduces their sense of control over their, the economic part of their lives. I think that's, you know, there is more. It may lead to higher productivity of the workforce as a whole, um, but in the same way that jobs for life and one skill for life and so on, this increased level of churn does create a reduced sense of control. And in that situation, then other, I other elements of one's identity, i.e. one's social or national identity, um, may become uh, even more precious to people. Um, and so I think that what these people understood is what Simon phrases in this way. So populist politicians provide revenge fantasies for the disaffected against the cultural elite. And interestingly, that's not the money delete. So Trump's got loads of money, but he still um, can speak to the sort of, uh, you know, entirely disaffected, marginalized, uh, m largely uh, white working class um, all over the states who uh, are just intensely irritated and sometimes violently so uh, by people like us and our equivalents, you know, at universities and so on, law firms uh, in the United States. Um, and this is the kind of archetypal poster, you know, so this is by Labour Leave, so this is, you know, in principle a party that should, or has its history in looking after the working class, saying, you know, wipe the smile off their faces, you know, it's an ultra-emotional message, uh, not think about your economic uh, livelihood or your economic best interest, but in a world where people maybe don't think that economic, poli whether it can or not is another matter, what matters is what people perceive and think, if they have the perception, especially after the financial crisis, that economic policy can't help them very much, then it's a fairly small leap to think that economists and elites don't care about them very much. And then, you know, do you really care about a small change as it's sold to you in likely economic policy, or do you want to wipe the smile off their faces, you know? Um, and, and, and that clearly, and that kind of image, uh, was very powerful. So. Uh, if you think back to the slides at the beginning and using the brain, I think that um, many, many people in the commission, and I think this is a JRC point, you know, we spent years and years, and it's even truer for this audience who've got many more higher degrees than I have, you know, spent years and years in lectures because they enjoyed it and they did them well, learning and learning and learning, then you get to the point in your career where you're no longer, I mean, it's like it now, right? You know, you're, you're, you get to the point where you're giving the lectures rather than receiving lectures. Um, but the trouble is, if you try to put yourself in the place of the people that this advert was aimed at, then the worst possible communication technique that you could imagine is giving a lecture to people who are already ultra hostile to you. Um, so I did dare to show this to people uh, in the commission, um, and nobody threw anything at me. Um, uh, so my argument is that we should do a lot more of this so that's an ear, um, i.e. I. listening. Um, and if you do that, and less lecturing, uh, then you can get better at doing this. That was a bit longer than I planned, but um, I hope it was um, uh, a bit different. Thanks very much. Uh, I, did, I was much longer than I said it would be, and you were very patient, so I, uh, we, can, we can leave it, or if there are any questions, you're very welcome. It's um, entirely, entirely as, as uh, you see fit. I might, might be back to the office time. Oh. Yes, thanks for the presentation, very nice. And it also gives uh, you know, creative... Uh, it opens the creative channels uh, in, in this environment, which I think is very good. Um, I was wondering if in the meetings that you've had so far, uh, you have been talking about social um, epidemics, uh, epidemics uh, also. Social epidemics. 
So uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in his book *The Tipping Point*, uh, explains how uh, some of the uh, the past um, uh, events have uh, phenomena have evolved uh, from from a social uh, statistical point of view, and he basically uh, distinguishes between three types of messengers that are important in this context, and. Um, uh, and I was I was wondering if, uh, if if someone in in the workshop that you have organized so far has uh, has represented this uh, point of view. No, not directly, but I think um, one one of his types. It's a while since I read the book, but one of them is definitely multipliers. So he definitely advocates, you know, passing messages to the people who are listened to, as opposed to. Uh, trying to do it as Ian Bolbrecht from the JRC in ISPRA. So getting Simon to write the articles was definitely an example of that. And I think the, one of the things that I find interesting in this uh, Facebook, you can geographically target. Um, so for, for our book, Just for Fun, I have a list of uh, people who live within two miles of uh, Schumann Roundabout in Brussels who are aged 30 to 50, have children under 12 and who work in either the EU institutions, the main newspapers or law firms or lobbyists. And that's about two and a half thousand Facebook users. And then Facebook for, ten, for $10 US lets you send messages to them. I mean, things that appear on their timeline. Um, and that would be a way of, of targeting the multipliers that I think um, could very easily be used, you know, to find the the Den Haag uh, 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 influencing bubble, or you know, the journalists, the governments, then. And I also think um, uh, the other thing that's interesting with this stuff is that it lets you sequence messages. So um, imagine that you want to talk to a group of uh, Bavarians, you know, probably pretty, on average, socially conservative people, but they're also interested in agriculture. Then, if you wanted to try to awaken their European feeling in advance of trying to get them to vote in the EU elections, you might want to target some information about the common agricultural policy and food standards for a few weeks, and then hope, you know, all of this is a bit chaotic and it might never work, and you know, um, and then uh, a few weeks later you would send a few messages about, you know, the European elections are coming up and it would be great if you exercised your your right as a citizen to choose your representative. So I think that's another way of um, uh, trying to awaken a constructive interest in an issue. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a big social rights agenda of the European Union, but sending that to uh, farmers in Bavaria might not be the best way to encourage them to, to vote in a constructive way, at least in, in European elections. Um, but it does allow potentially the possibility of, of um, subdividing and, and segmenting. Daniel? Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, having a lot of images and less text. And I, th and I think, uh, or, or the question it triggers is that, okay, what can we uh, use from it uh, for talking to uh, policy DGs, for instance, in Brussels. And uh, the main question which uh, keeps reoccurring is, in essence, how much can we learn from Trump uh, in the context of credibility and reputation? One of the things he didn't care about was uh, reputation. Targeting different messages to different audience, or maybe not necessarily, essentially meant that he was self-contradicting, uh, confusing. It was very clear if you read the uh, respectable papers, all these were pointed out and still it worked. Would it also work uh, in our case if we delivered different messages? So would it not harm the reputation of uh, I don't know, someone who is trying to uh, pretend that she or he is a serious researcher, if uh, she or he shows pictures and uh, somehow gets confronted in an in inconvenient environment. I mean, I'm, I'm just asking. 
No, I mean, most of the colleagues here know much better than me what works in uniquely academic environments, and I've got no, uh, I've probably got no lessons to give at all, but I've certainly got no lessons to give on, 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 on that area of JRC uh, communication. Maybe two thoughts. I mean, one is that I think what Trump is very, very, and he's a very clever man. I mean, I still think, in spite of the ultra vulgarity and despicable, but I don't think that makes him stupid. I think he's very good at identifying tribes and tribal allegiances. Um, and, you know, he has understood the emotional triggers of the US white working class. Um, and he presses them on a daily basis um, because these people are marginalized and disaffected and they don't really feel that anybody cares about them. So he channels their anger. Um, and facts and academic rigor are just not part of that emotional story. Um, so I guess to the extent that um, I do think it's a useful exercise, um, I'm not for a moment, and I tried to make very clear, you know, the head is the best way to make policy. I'm not for a moment advocating, uh, uh, you know, pure emotionality and bridge building, you know, um, or engineering, you know. Um, uh, but I am absolutely advocating, reflecting on the tribal membership maybe of an audience. I mean, you see this absolutely in economics, right? If you go to a central bank conference, then you can have a pretty clear sense of the tribal uh, economic grouping to which those people would uh, mainly belong, you know. Uh, they will all be wearing ties, which, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've been to plenty of events with them and there's nothing wrong with it, but you may want to calibrate your messages uh, to their worldview. Um, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that people in this audience don't do it, but it is an additional step and I think it is a thought, a useful one to go through before going to any type of conference, you know. Um, and then on, on images and, and rigor, I mean, I very much doubt that one can make a, a serious academic rep reputation purely on the basis of showing these kinds of, of images. But I guess they are a bit of a metaphor for me when I give this talk. I mean, the last when I gave it on Tuesday, everybody had in front of them a screen like this. And I said, think of that a little bit metaphorically as your smartphone screen when you're on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. <clears throat> and you're seeing a number of images flashing past, <clears throat> each one of which is trying to emotionally engage you at some level. So I think as a metaphor for how an awful lot of the communication that I'm talking about actually happens, I think that's a fairly legitimate set of slides on that meta level. But I'm not for a moment you know, um, uh, one can't go to an economics conference and present, you know, slides with no e econometrics behind. I mean, that's clearly not appropriate. Um, but for this, for, for uh, a presentation about the, uh, you know, the first slide more or less is we live in visual times, then I think it's on a meta level also quite potentially even telling or valid to then have a very visual presentation. Hey. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, my question goes back a bit to the beginning of the talk. I would like you to elaborate a bit more on the on the why. Mm -hmm. So you talk a lot about obviously about uh, communication, but I wasn't entirely sure if I got um, what the initial problem is. So you've talked a lot about kind of improving communication and reaching audiences, getting audiences where they are. But I wasn't quite sure kind of what is what is the initial problem. Like it might be different if you're talking about getting votes or as just Daniel was mentioning, getting visibility within our own organization. So I wasn't quite sure what the goal is. And that maybe also just in the discussion, uh, maybe slightly provocative sound uh, thought, we tend to assume that people got tricked by Trump or people get tricked by by these whole techniques. But this then again assumes that people are idiots to some degree. So what if we just as a thought experiment um, think about what if they made the right choice in not voting for Hillary? That seems to be a given in all those discussions, that they were tricked and made the wrong choice. But that's also a kind of very elitist perspective. 
So on the, the second one, I think, is in a way the much more interesting question. On, on the why, maybe I said it too quickly, but just in a very administrative, mechanical sense, um, uh, President Juncker made some remarks in December where um, he basically said, I haven't got them with me, um, but you know, after Brexit and Trump, uh, we've got real concerns about how communication is, is passing via the media to people. Um, and there was a particular concern. <clears throat> there was an article in Das Magazin um, towards the very end of 2016, which made some, it turns out, exaggerated claims about the um, potential effectiveness of this psycho-targeting. Um, but we were asked to look into it. So in, in, in terms of the why, in a very mechanical sense, as the JRC, uh, the president of the commission expressed concerns, the first vice president expressed concerns, somebody spoke to Vlado and he turned in our direction. So I, that I, I, maybe I didn't explain it clearly enough, but that was when I said the why was simple. I meant in terms of why did we in the JRC begin looking at this issue? Um, I'm sure there are bigger whys, but that was the why that I was trying to explain. And then in terms of the tricks, I hope I said quite clearly that I'm not convinced that that many people were, were completely tricked. I mean, I think that there was and there is still a huge amount of anger, um, especially linked to the financial crisis, um, where people have uh, much less faith in uh, the capacity of uh, elites, many of whom are perceived to be economists, um, to, to look after their interests. I think they feel that, you know, um, uh, governments lost control uh, in the years running up to the, to the financial crisis. And, you know, in a country like, like Greece or bits of the Eurozone, that's even amplified for, for other reasons. Um, and that people who lose faith in policy then vote primarily on emotional terms is not the same as being tricked. Um, and I think um, there, are, there are a couple of people, actually Simon Cooper this week in the, I do read other journalists as well as Simon Cooper in the Financial Times, it's just he happens to have, so he has a piece this week where he talks about the idea that continental Europe in many ways is better insulated than the United States from uh, populist risks um, because there's a bigger social state which looks after people better, I mean, which is on average clearly the case relative to the United States, especially if you take away uh, Medicare. Um, but I hope I very clearly said that, um, uh, I mean, I said it very explicitly about the art and Carol Cadwallader and The Guardian, you know, it would be, and I think her work, where one needs to be cautious about her writing. And by the way, I mean, there's a lot more, the, the, the academics haven't caught up yet in terms of the publishing delays to get things into journals. I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to read academic work in this area. It's just the topic's so fresh that most of the stuff is in, is in, is in uh, I can send around a few links afterwards. There was a good piece in the New York Review of Books, for example, on all of this, but I'm not sure that academic publishing, I'm sure there'll be a lot of stuff, but probably in six months to, to, to a year or two. Uh, but I think that the Carol Cadwallader stuff um, uh, uh, really does lead people down the, the path of, um, you know, some billionaires with uh, very right-wing agendas were, were tricking the masses against their own interest. And I think that's a bit too easy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting and very actual, actually. Um, I have some comments and uh, questions. Comments, we keep thinking that making our decisions based on emotions is bad. And I don't really understand why we, okay, people should have facts, but as, as in the book of, of Daniel Kahneman, we cannot be constantly making decisions based on complex um, facts. And so we, we might as well just accept that people will make uh, uh, decisions based on emotions. And, and these, lately, these, these decisions made lately were made because people don't feel well. So. Maybe we should focus on making people feel well again. Um, then um, a question is, or where is this working going now in the future? And another question is if there's something planned on also um, 
trying to understand to what extent people are aware of how much they give away of their privacy and if they are aware of this and, and how this is being used without their consent. Uh, because I think most of us, even this educated audience, is not aware of how much of our lives are out there being controlled by big companies like uh, Facebook and Google. And to what extent also does the Commission um, in policy making addresses this, these issues? I'm not aware, but maybe you are, of, of big corporations having big amounts of data about everyone. And no, on, on, I hope you don't think that I said um, making decisions based on emotions is bad. I, I definitely didn't try to say that. What I tried to say was making government policy or uh, engineering design uh, based on emotions is, is, is bad. I mean, having some element of emotionality in government decision making, I think, is, is not a bad thing. Um, you know, if you want to think about... Um, how all sorts of systems that involve humans, you know, if you want to design a transport system that works, then you could argue that road markings on roads are a certain type of, you know, um, psychological nudge. I mean, you know, it's surprisingly effective that all you need is, uh, you know, it's a norm which is encouraged by a little bit of paint on a road. Incredibly powerful when, when you think about it. I mean, it's not a fence, and, you know. Anyway. Um, but emotions are definitely part of human decision making and the vast majority of decisions that we make on any given day are subconscious because they have to be because our um, system two as Kahneman calls it is just too inefficient so we had one nice example he has if you try to do um, a sum like I don't know I have to make it a bit harder in this audience because you're all so quick but you know try to do 17 multiplied by 31 and then pick another sum that's almost as difficult and do it while you're running and you'll find that your brain is much, system two is much slower, even walking quickly slows down system two um, uh, by a surprisingly large amount. You, it's an experiment you can do in a few seconds with yourself, um, or in my case, a few minutes. Um, and um, uh, so then you ask, where are we going with the work? That's a very good question. Um, so there's the um, Center for um, Advanced Studies uh, here in ISPRA. So we hope to get George Lakoff, I'm pretty sure we will, uh, to come to the annual conference. And he hopefully then uh, will, uh, and he's very interested to work with a number of um, European social political scientists here at the JRC. So there'd be some contract agents perhaps brought in to do that work. Then there are also one or two people in David Mayer's team. So this is H1 in Brussels who are interested especially in uh, communicating science in a whoops, sorry in a post-truth world that's what the annual conference is about and then uh, Pablo's gone but in principle we would carry on trying to do something linked to uh, I mean I described it in crude terms but um, price differentiation based on emotional type or emotional state so we'd like to try and do some work on that uh, within the unit and we'll try and make sure that that stays linked together um, across the three things I mentioned. So we'll see, it's an emerging research project, but I think it's serious work. There's always, I always feel like someone with an economist background, you kind of have to double justify work that's linked to psychology and emotion, but that's probably my own, one of my own biases. Um, in terms of privacy, um, I'm aware the time's ticking on and people have got, you know, um, uh, but um, in terms of privacy, the Commission has, um, you know, for years been legislating or proposing heavy uh, legislation in that area, and it's the, I always get the acronym wrong, it's the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which comes into force in 2018 and is a big um, uh, limiting factor on a lot of this in the EU relative to what companies can do in the US. I'll send a few links around the unit. There's a very, I mean, if people have time, there's a very good uh, podcast <clears throat> uh, done by Michael Bassetta, the, the uh, caricature guy, uh, who's a, an academic at Copen Copenhagen University with um, one of Trump's big data people. One, one of the good things about job flexibility is that all these people, they do a political campaign and then they kind of have to market their service. They work on short-term contracts, you know? So when they've finished, it's actually not that difficult to find out what they've done because broadcasting it is their way of being recruited by a new, um, so it's actually not as difficult to find out some version of the truth on all of this. So there's a, this guy does, very, they're really excellent podcasts and he, he 
He's a good um, kind of radio journalist as well as academic. Um, I think that covered what you asked. I don't, I don't want to take too much time. Um, then I think, um, thanks very much, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.